Welcome to the School of Hops. Today I got our guest, Stephen Bach of Stephen Bach Homebrews. Today we're going to talk about New England IPAs. So Stephen, you're a Connecticut home brewer, and we met recently at uh, Freedom Fest a couple months back, yep. and uh, you had some banging ass beers there. <laughs> yeah, thanks, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. So uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, let's see. I am a couple of things, I guess. Beer is kind of my uh, slowly becoming my profession, which is awesome. Um, but it's also a major hobby for me. Uh, I've been home brewing for about three years now. Done a couple hundred batches. I probably brew about once a week. Um, mostly American IPAs, but some stouts too, and a couple of sour beers I've sort of delved into. I'm, uh, I'm also a, a musician, uh, and a hockey player, among other things. History nerd. Ah, yeah. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, what got you into homebrewing? Let's see. Uh, honestly, it was just trying some of the really wacky stuff coming out of the Dogfish Head in Maryland. And, uh, Delaware? Delaware. Yeah, 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 Delaware. 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 <laughs> Rewind. Sorry, yes. Geography fail. <laughs> yeah, some of those wacky, um, you know, ingredients and sort of infusions and things they do made me kind of think about, like, you know, if Sam Calagione could do this stuff, starting out in his home, bring these small five-gallon batches, and, you know, that's something that's worth getting in on because it just, it seems so fun to be able to brew your own stuff uh, and just be able to, like, throw it on tap or have bottles. Yeah, and so that led me to actually first go online. Uh, the first couple of resources I found were uh, John Palmer's How to Brew. <laughs> uh, the Bible, right? There. Yeah, the, <laughs> yeah, like kicking it old school. And uh, I got a huge shout out to the guys and gals at Maltose Express. <laughs> Absolutely. Mark and Tess, Mark amazing. And Tess, yeah. It's funny you said that the thing about Sam Calgione, though, because like, he was the one who kind of sparked that in my brain, too. I, I came across a YouTube video of him when I was working at the liquor store, and uh, you know, they were doing some funky stuff, and he was telling a story about how he like got into home brewing. He made like this cherry, this cherry beer. And, you know, he knew from that moment, it was like, you know, he wanted to brew forever. And it kind of like sparked my interest as well in home brewing. I was like, Oh, what is that? Uh, I can give that a try. So, uh, where are you working now? Uh, a couple of places. So I guess I do sort of a lot of things, sort of a weird freelance, uh, brewer ish thing. Yeah. Music. Getting um, around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess my primary mode of occupation would be at uh, New England Brewing Company in Woodbridge. Um, I work in the tap room there. And I also uh, am a brewing intern over at Outer Light in Groton, uh, working with Tyler Cox, um, the brewmaster up there. He's teaching me lots of stuff. I know New England uh, just, you know, has a New England IPA. Yes, New England. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah um, so I'm sure that you can kind of classify a lot of those beers that Nepco makes as New England IPAs. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of their beers have that sort of hanging hop oil. You get those fruit forward, the high alpha hops, you know, you got your Galaxy, your Citra, Nelson Sauvin, mm -hmm. uh, all the kind of like hot hops of the moment. Nelson <laughs> Sauvin, the great hop. Right. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's where, that's where my, all my paychecks go. Is just over to New <laughs> Zealand. Yeah, I'm directly supporting. just funding the New Zealand hot right, farmers. Right, right. Through that and and watching Flight of the Concords, I'm just personally oh. financing the economic. Uh, you know, I the love economy. that. I love that TV show. So, tell me a little bit about you wanting to go pro. Do you want to open your own brewery, or do you want to work for another brewer? Definitely, um, I definitely have aspirations of one day opening my own place. But as I've learned from talking to brewers and head brewers and brewery owners around the state uh, and the region kind of getting the cautious advice um, <laughs> don't which, do it dude right no I, i'm kind of been flat out I've, some people have told me flat out don't do it you're a fucking idiot oh that's great <laughs> but, um no um no but it's good it's good advice you got to take um the good with the bad and you got to consider this stuff so i don't know hopefully a few years down the road um, I'll be able to do something like that. But right now, I'm just focused on getting the proper technical experience. Mm -hmm. First things first is really learn how to play with the big boy equipment. For sure. And transfer some of the scientific knowledge Absolutely. I've acquired over to really understanding how to brew on huge systems and do CIP and mm -hmm. all of the, the really labor-intensive um, hard work that goes into yeah. commercial brewing. So let's talk about some of your classes. You got, you got one going on in uh, Maltos Express for the New England IPAs. Right, yeah. Um, so that has sort of grown out of my relationship with Mark and Tess um, over the past couple of years, just like patronizing the shop and getting brewing advice. Pretty much since I 
since I started doing this, I've been obsessed with like, you know, American IPAs, you know, using, you know, some of those hops we talked about earlier. Um, I think the first beer that really got me like, hey, I want to brew something like that was Fuzzy Baby Ducks. Yeah. <laughs> over I've, I've yet to have it. I hear a lot about it. It's like, I feel like I hear the name all the time. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a huge Connecticut beer. Um, you know, and, and I think most people um, who really love um, Nebco will be like, oh, you know, it's not their, um, not even their best IPA. Um, and I would probably agree with that, um, you know, because it is a single hop and therefore like there's only a certain amount of complexity you can get. Yep. When is your next class coming up? Um, the next class I've got is basically a New England IPA seminar tasting thing going on at the Beer Collective, which mm -hmm. is a new bar in New Haven. And so they're going to bring me in to talk sort of about what we're talking about right now, mm -hmm. talk about some brewing methods, um, talk about sort of the history of the development of this style, the New England IPA, mm -hmm. as it were, you yeah. know, recipe formulation and all that. Mm -hmm. So um, when is the Maltose one going on? Maltose is November 5th, and that'll be a little bit more involved um, with direct uh, home brewing applications. You know, I'll probably try to tailor um, the way that I'm talking about the stuff to an audience of drinkers and then to an audience of drinkers and people who directly want to brew those beers. So uh, how does somebody sign up for these classes? Uh, so to sign up um, with Maltos, you just give them a call. Um, the number's on their website. Um, you can just look them up. It's Maltos. Um, Maltosexpress.net. Net. Yeah. And, old uh, school. Yes. Old school in so many ways, but still killing it. And uh, so what about the Beer Collective? How does someone sign up for that? Beer Collective? Um, yeah, just look them up on Facebook. There's an event page there. I believe it's 35 per person and includes um, a lot of like sampling. Uh, I'll have some of my beers there. We'll have stuff from, you know, sort of the big names, mm -hmm. IPAs of the moment. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, they'll be putting some stuff on draft as well that'll fit the bill. For, for sure. So I asked you to bring some of your beer today and you didn't just bring a beer, you brought a keg of beer. Which, right. You know, now we have tons of beer to drink. And unfortunately, I still have a beer in this. I guess it's not unfortunate, but... I need to finish this. I didn't want to waste it. And now I'm going to go get uh, some more of yours. Yeah, get uh, us more beer. Oh, my God, dude. This is so... <laughs> right? It's so fucking dang. I can't believe the aroma is held up that well after, a, you know, a brutal trip to smoke in the valley. <laughs> smoke in the valley and then to my, my kegerator. <laughs> well, now that we're all topped off on beers. Yeah. This, I mean, this almost looks like hot milk. Um, especially in this light. <laughs> oh yeah, but it's, um, it's, the light uh, is not doing us any favors. <laughs> not, not for that camera. No, at least. not for the front <laughs> camera. <laughs> yeah. um, it is unique though. Like to me, I, I think I had told you like when I asked you to do the show, I was like, I haven't had many of these beers yet. Uh, but uh, no, I was excited that I found out you're doing this presentation, and um, I was like, I need to learn about these because I know jack shit. So that's cool though, because most people like most people I meet that like are into New England IPAs or like people that maybe didn't just start drinking craft beer, but sure. like they just, um, they'll patronize a couple breweries. Like it'll be just like Treehouse, it'll be Trillium. Great yeah. breweries, make excellent beer. But um, I think people get a little bit myopic. They get a little bit narrow minded mm -hmm. when it comes to the style of beer IPAs or, you know, just beer in general. It's like they get focused on these big names, you know, where you go there and like you pick up, a couple of cases and then there's this whole thing with like hoarding these beers in your fridge and like people online oh, go back geez. and forth you know like the hall picks I, 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 I feel like all right i'm part of connecticut beer drinkers yep. and i feel like every yeah. day there's yeah. somebody showing me a picture of their fridge i'm like right. why aren't you inviting your homies over yeah like, way to be selfish <laughs> right no it doesn't stop holding it out yeah <laughs> right yeah so uh let's talk about treehouse and trillium because you know since the day i've moved here uh, that's all I've heard is those two like, yeah. names. It's like Treehouse, Chilean. Have you been there? Have you been there? I have not been there, uh, so don't crucify me because of that. I'll, I'll I, forgive you even if uh, CT <laughs> beer drinkers will not. We're but, gonna um, release the hounds. But you want to know what? We do have some of those beers today, so I will be uh, popping the cherry on that one, and uh, we get to try them out. Pop some cans. Pop some cans. Let's say, what are some of the best breweries that are making these New England IPAs? Is it just these two? Um, no. what about like some like main beer company? I know makes some great beers. Yes. Does Hill Farmstead touch base on it? Tell me about some yeah, of these other breweries. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, well, let's see, you mentioned a couple. Um, I, I think that sort of the progenitor of the style, uh, as it were reluctantly, uh, interestingly enough, uh, is John Kimmich over at the Alchemist. Yep. <laughs> 
Um, and so John started picking up what he knew about IPAs um, starting in like 1994 uh-huh. uh, at the Vermont Pub in Waterbury, um, learning from Greg Noonan. You know, they he that was where I think he got the bug for like sort of these hazy IPAs. Um, but you know, importantly, I think this relates more broadly to this whole discussion. Um, you know, what he was trying to do was just like infuse the beer was with as much like you know pungent like hop aroma and just a sort of saturated hop character with this flavor. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he wasn't trying to make a beer that was purposefully loaded with haze. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of home brewers that are getting into it and like new brewers, um, even on the commercial side that are getting into this style sort of miss. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of this sort of um, adding in of like really weird, bizarre adjuncts. I've heard like people add flour. Flour, yeah. Oh gosh. It would never do it. Um, so like, I, I mean, I can only imagine that like Kimish, like when he made his first beer, he got hazed due to just adding a boatload of freaking hops to his beer. Right. Well, like his whole thing was like the unfiltered um, IPA. Um, I'm all about unfiltered beer. I think I, I think it's great. You know, if you're producing local beer, if you're trying to go out of state, you know, out of the country, let's say, you know, centrifuging it is is great too. But yeah, filters, if you're filters, a centrifuge. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think there's only like two breweries in the state that have them. Stony Creek got one. Um, I know Thimble has one. I don't know who else. I, I'm assuming two roads. I would does. assume, yeah. I mean, I mean <laughs> they're the craft. That beer. is like brewer's playground. Yeah. That brewery is unreal. Yeah, I'm really cool. Speaking of two roads, uh, Jared just gave us two juicy the other day, yes. which was freaking phenomenal. Yeah, I just I want my immediate thought was like, if you put this in a 16 ounce can and like sell it in a four pack, people everyone's gonna line up at the door. Yeah, they'll, they'll they'll make it. They're gonna be making lines at the door there. <laughs> But, back to, back yeah. to like the alchemists and them starting sure. this. Uh, well, actually, not even alchemists. I think it was John Kimmich at Vermont Pub and Brewery. Is what you're saying? Yeah. You know, he was. Um, I'm not sure exactly where he got the yeast strain that's known as Conan. Mm-hmm. It's an English strain, I guess, that was like sort of like a mutation of like some English strain. I'm not really sure. I think I don't know if Noonan sort of gave it to him and then like he took it and did his own thing with it. I think that's sort of what I've heard. Mm-hmm. But so that yeast, along with the hops that he was using and how he was using them did also kind of contribute to haze because anyone who's ever brewed with Conan knows that it definitely sort of hangs stuff in mm-hmm. suspension. And it also throws off sort of like a peachy ester thing that's going on if you like get near your airlock or whatever, yeah. you blow off, whatever whatever it is. You can it smells smell like, like, like peaches, you know, regardless of what hops you really have in there. But like once you kind of you know, you put any of those fruity hops, like you put in your Citra, Mosaic, Galaxy, Nelson, anything. Yeah. Uh, you blend those things together with a yeast like that, and you've just got this fruity, like, almost, you know, overwhelmingly juicy it is. Uh, I, I, aroma yeah. and, and flavor, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to throw in a pitch right here. Throw in uh, a pitch. Yeah, you ready for it? Plug something. Omega Yeast Labs, Dippa Yeast, I think it's OYL052. They actually propped up the Conan yeast. As far as I'm concerned, maybe I'm not supposed to say that, but they propped it up and I brewed with that yeast. Uh, yeah. Lance is awesome over there, Lance and Adi. They came in one day to my store and they were like, hey, we got this new yeast today. And it was freaking unreal. It gives you like those peachy, I don't want to use the word apple, but it was like stone fruity type yeah. of like awesome aromas. Just, yeah. And it kind of accentuated these hot flavors. And it wasn't as, it was more flocculent than this. Uh, yeah, color is de- okay, yeah. so this is this beer. Um, this is my double IPA that mm-hmm. I call Glow Into You, mm-hmm. um, and it's, uh, I used the London Ale 3, or why you 1318, 1318, right? yeah. yeah. Both swirl for effect. We need aroma. We yeah. need head. Dude. We need lacing. It all needs to happen. All right. <laughs> it does smell really good. It does. Every time. It just smells like fucking fresh hops. So the 1318, like, uh, it's clearly not as flocculent as you had planned on it. Do you do anything else to get more you know, less flocculation, I should say, out of your beers? So whatever is happening with 1318 in beers like this is a little confusing to me. I'm not, you know, I've seen like a couple of articles. I've had discussions amongst my friends, some of which are in a a Facebook group called Treehouse Home Brewers, Mm -hmm. uh, which actually started out as a group for people who are interested in cloning Treehouse beers, you know, replicating recipes and like guessing ingredients and things. That sort of morphed um, over time into 
just a sort of a collective of people trying to like brew better New England style IPAs. Sure. And you know, my friend Matt has sort of said to me like, well, it must be something unique to this strain that like causes these proteins and hop and grain polyphenols mm-hmm. to hang in suspension or the hop oils to hang in suspension. Um, and I talked to one of my head brewer friends and he was just like, well, well like, yeast doesn't really do that. And I'm like, okay, so I'm just like back to the drawing board in terms yeah. of understanding it. Um, but so, for example, with this beer, this beer has um, some protonaceous grains in it. There are some flaked oats. Protonaceous D. Just D? Protonaceous D. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah, but it's got like these these uh, protein-rich grains. It does have flaked oats. Um, mm-hmm. And with flaked oats, we have a higher protein content. And it thickens the body. It gives you sort of a rounder mouthfeel. One thing that I do is I typically combine really aggressive late hopping. So I'll do like last couple minute additions Mm -hmm. that are pretty large. And then also a Whirlpool or Hop Stand edition that's pretty large as well and a big dry hop edition. So all those things are like liable by themselves Mm -hmm. to leave stuff in suspension and give you a hazy appearance. But I don't use any findings. But after I do do a pretty thorough cold crash, I'll, I'll drop my beers down to like almost to like 34 and I'll leave it there for like three days. So at that point I end up with, you know, just a really thick cake at the bottom of my carboys. That's like, obviously there's like yeast and then the dry hop sitting right on top and it's like, it's solid. And then I'll move that carboy, like when I'm ready to, to rack and, and transfer that into a keg, you know, I move it very, very carefully so as not to disturb any of the sediment in the bottom. And I move it up onto the countertop or wherever, whatever I'm doing. And it's in the light, so I can see what's happening inside the carboy, you know, because it's clear. Yeah. It's different than, like, you know, a stainless mm-hmm. steel fermenter on, like, a commercial level. You can see what's going on with your beer, which is one of the cool things about homebrew. You have that control and that level of, like, being able to just, like, take a quick peek, like, you know, without, yeah. like, pulling some through, like, a sight glass or whatever. Like <laughs> For sure. So, so one thing I've noticed about, like, these beers that apparently have, like, a lot of yeast and suspension still, they don't have yeast bites. No. You know, like, where you get, like, that yeast bite, yep, and it's, it like, just fucking burns your throat, it and it's, the like, worst. Uh, would you say, like, more of this haze is coming from hops rather than the, than the yeast, or well, is see, it that's how I need to borrow it? somebody's, like, electron spectrometer microscope to figure it out, because sure. I, I, I certainly can't afford it. When I look at the beer, like, if I hold it, like, right up to the light, and then I stick my nose right up to it, you know, I've stuck a flashlight. Like this? Like yeah. this? Like yeah, this. yeah, right that. Or okay. like that. I've, I've stuck a flashlight into it. Like, I can see no physical little... There's no debris. Pieces. There's yeah. no debris. Um, because of that thorough cold crash and careful racking and kegging procedure. And it doesn't have that burn or that, like, you know, that aggressive, like, bite that gets yeah. you in the throat. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, and this keg's been sitting around for days. Like, I mean, you talk about, like, roll the can or whatever, yeah. this ridiculous kind of, like, terminology joke. I don't know. Is it a joke? Is it real? It's floating around. But, like, so this keg was... This keg has been transferred around, like, uh, in three days to, like, three different residences. Yeah. But I, in transit, it obviously got jostled around. Like, if there was any crap at the bottom of my keg, it would be in the beer. I'm not, But that's not, like, trying to toot my own horn. It's just, like, a... It's sort of a question of... <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what... I'm a little bit confused, I guess, about what's going on with a yeast like London Ale 3. I've worked with 1318, and I've brewed with Conan. Mm-hmm. They don't resemble each other at all, I don't think. Mm, there are similarities, well, but they're definitely not, like, one and the same. I mean, do you get peachy out of this? Well, it's hard to tell, honestly. There's just there's so too, much fucking hop. There's too, <laughs> much, there's too much hop character yeah. going on, honestly. Um, I think, like... It's the, probably the a thing complimentary with, thing. Um, yeah. I, you know, I haven't brewed, like, relatively, like, you know, less involved beers, like a single hop or something with this. So I, 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 it's hard for me to really get a full grasp on what it is. But, like, my friends have told me that it's got kind of a citrusy ester characteristic whereas like conan is like distinctly peachy something that's unique about your beers and it's maybe a british thing is like it smells creamy creamy malt aroma and then you have this like citrus there's like citrus melon apricotty like and then you take a sip of it and it's just juice <laughs> <laughs> right so then that's that that sort of brings up the whole thing about like the idea of the juicy IPA. Yeah. yeah, so like going back to like the differences in how people brew these beers at home and on a commercial level, like some people opt just to make beers that aren't bitter. For me, I am 
you know, well, obviously not like super old school in approach, like in that way. I definitely need that sort of bitter, consistent bite um, mm. throughout the sip. So it kind of remind me what the hell I'm drinking. Like, first of yeah. all, I want to, I want to, I want to be drinking a beer, not a glass of juice. And I usually, you know, just will do like a bittering hop edition at sixty. Um, to how, get many, how many IBUs do you look for in that first edition? Uh, it really depends. Um, I kind of follow that sort of old rule of thumb of like, you know, ten IBUs for like percentage of like potential alcohol. Are you looking for seventy IBUs total? Or is yeah, it... more like 70 total. So I like I have a, one of my recipes here. Mm -hmm. Secret. <laughs> sure, so the beer that we're drinking, um, the Bittering Edition <laughs> contributes... <laughs> the Bittering Edition contributes um, about 40 IBUs, and the rest of them are gained through additions later, but still in the boil. And then there's... I guess some perceived bitterness that comes from additions during that whirlpool steep, but theoretically under 175 degrees Fahrenheit, I think it is. You don't get isomerization of those alpha acids. In international yeah. Bitter so are you units. steeping at a certain temperature? Are you steeping yeah. at? Right. Are you doing it at whirlpool still within a 200 range, or are mm -hmm. you cooling it a little bit and then adding the hops at a later point? Uh, most of the time, like my personal approach will be like uh, bittering charge at like 60, and then somewhere around the last. 10 minutes to like flame out there'll be another edition and then a whirlpool edition and then a dry hop. so basically when i'm doing this whirlpool edition uh, on the homebrew level uh what i'm doing is i will drop the beer from you know boil, where boil at, yeah. at flame out as rapidly as possible to 170 degrees Got it. Uh, usually and what i'll do is i will add whatever hops i've got load it up there and then I'll you know kind of recirculate it gently a lot of people uh, that I know will use like a pump I just you know I can't afford that so I just have a spoon you brew on a budget I, I brew very much on a budget one thing I noticed about like your beer like, the bitterness is soft and I, I think it definitely has a lot to do with that addition that you're talking about right now and it also has this flavor that like you don't get from a flavor addition it's way more pungent you, know, you added these hops in there at 170 you hold it and it's capturing this flavor of the yeah. hop that just never gets boiled off. And so, like, that's the first beer that, for me, turned me on to that idea was Hetty Topper. I was just like, holy shit. Here is this, like, oily, just, like, dank as hell. Like, really nice, bittering thing that washes over your whole tongue and kind of sticks around. And the finish, but you've also got this, like fruity, really citrusy, and some of that peachiness happening as well. So that's what led me to be like, well, how the hell do you do that? Tearing through, like, uh, homebrewing forums, beer advocate, and everything, BYO, Zimmergy, and stuff. Like, I was looking at Vinny, um... Solerzo? Solerzo's clone for Pliny the Elder, which is actually more West Coasty, but sort of another huge contributor to the IPA movement. The other kind of funny thing is that they're in, like so many other things, there's this East versus West uh, sort of mentality, which is, to me, sort of silly. Like, people who, like, who love Treehouse or love Hill Farmstead or love Trillium or Night Shift or love Nebco, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever it is, like, <laughs> some of these people like those beers, like, sort of to the exclusion of West Coast-style IPAs, which, to me, that's sort of silly because, like, you have to think about what West Coast beer did for the craft movement, like mm -hmm. in the 90s, you know, you got Sierra Nevada Pale Ale and like the Chico uh, yeast strain. Yeah. That beer kind of like, you know, changed the face of American beer by creating this sort of like hoppy, pungent, kind of like bitter pale ale that was still just a like, great easy drinking and just sort of shocked people's palates at the time. Yeah. So my thing was this, is like I moved out here, I was living in Chicago for the past eight years and uh, you know, we had our local brewery we had, well, Goose, Goose Island was one of them, and we also had Revolution Brewing. And Revolution makes this friggin' phenomenal IPA called Antihero. With that, like, I had a standard set in my head of, like, oh, this is what an IPA sure. could taste like fresh. It, it was Stone IPA for me. That so was the idea that was just like, holy shit. One of, like, Stone, <laughs> Stone IPA is still one of the best IPAs out Mitch there. Steel like, is to a this god. Day. Mitch yep. Steele. Cheers know. to Mitch Steele. Cheers to Mitch. <laughs> But then I was hanging out with some homies, and my buddy Fitz, he came up, and he had this bottle, this fancy 750 milliliter flip-top bottle okay. of this brewery called Hill Farmstead, and I had never heard of them at the time. And I don't remember what the name of the beer was. That beer, like, 
rocked me. I was mm-hmm. like, this beer is unlike anything I've ever had before. Speaking of Hill Farms, we also drank another beer that day. It was a dark farmhouse beer that beer was like i was like all right what the frig is this brewery i need to go have it like now yeah uh, how do i you know, get there he was like it's oh only like five hours like, yeah he's like it's a robot no for us it was 16 18 hours from chicago right, right, right. so like i was like this is the brewery i was like all right i'm gonna try them out like you know i gotta go out there so i made it a mission like that when we came out here like that was one of the first things we did it showed me this whole other side of like the world like oh new new england is making these beers like I didn't have a New England IPA from Hill, you know, Hill Farmstead, but it like, holy smokes, there's great things going on in the Northeast right now. Let's get into trying some of uh, Treehouse and Trillium, like some of these New England IPAs. Let's do it. All right. Now that we have some empty glassware, let's talk about our first beer here. This is Alter Ego by Treehouse Brewing Company. It's uh, India Pale Ale, 6.8% volume, by volume. <laughs> 6.8% volume. They just filled the can this month. They filled it 6.8% of the way. <laughs> that, that's it. That's right? a secret, yeah. Dude. Well, there's a lot of breweries out there doing that, you know? So they're in Monsoon. <laughs> squeeze it. It's is it Monsoon way. or Monsoon? Monsoon? Like it's, it's pronounced Munson. I Munson. Think. Munson. So. That would be a good uh, name for a beer, though. I'm sure it is. Monsoon. Like I'm sure somebody has. They're probably going to take that from this video. Ultra Ego builds upon Julius with juicy citrus and tropical fruit flavors and aromas as a result of an intense mosaic and Amarillo dry hop. I'm into it. Yep. <laughs> Glow into it. All right. So we're going to pop this baby right here. Uh, we actually had to beg and barter for the beers for today's episode uh, at the last festival we were at. What was your homie's name? Matt. Matt? Matt Rice. Matt Rice. So go like him on Facebook. Sweet and, man. You know. Thanks, Matt. He actually hooked it up, dude. He, he, he did. I, mean, I don't know if it was a deal, but he, I paid five bucks for two beers. That's, which, yeah, that's no, a freaking... Eat. Treehouse, yeah. Do you get that anywhere Treehouse else? Is usually like um, like three twenty five to like four bucks a can, I think. You know, we didn't talk about what we did off off camera. Like we have a whisker. I have a whisker in there. How do you even roll it? <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> roll it. So uh, what do you do you know anything about this beer? Have you had it before? Yes. Yes I have. So uh, t- tell me like, a little about it. Supposedly it's like devil Julius, like the alter ego uh, Julius, which is sort of what um, made them famous um and julius is this like any relation to julius caesar julius caesar i think it was more of a take on like orange julius as related to julius caesar i don't know if we could speak on behalf of treehouse for that but uh you know dude it's like dang like yes dang yeah i mean i definitely get the the mosaic the amarillo you know that orangey is awesome i think both of those hops are unsubstitutable hops that have a very distinct aroma and flavor that you just can't quite get. I'm getting that mosaic character. It's not like a blueberry that everyone talks about. I'm getting the, like the mosaic, like I just took a fresh bag of mosaic and just laid in it. Mm-hmm. The Amarillo hops come through. I get like this pungentness that I can relate to. I also get a lot of like bready yep. malt flavor, mm-hmm. like malt aroma from yeah, it. Yeah, that bready, biscuity kind of backbone. I like to try out the grains and like eat yeah, all the grains. Like sure. if you take like fresh, I would say Pilsner Mall like has this like I think has a beautiful like grittiness to it. Oh my goodness! Like you breathe out, <laughs> yeah, and it's like this is like beautiful, 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 beautiful mall flavors that just coat the tongue very well. It has hop flavor in there. There are hops in this beer. There's- Spoiler alert. Hops Are there hops included? Wait, do, do they use hops in this? I think they do. I'm not sure. Their beers stand out for me in that they are just saturated with hop flavor and aroma. I, I just haven't had a beer that does it the same way. I'm not saying that like their IPAs or their pillows or whatever are like the best. The thing that always strikes me about these beers is they always describe the mouthfeel of their beers like Julius and like this as pillowy. It's got that like um, that white head that sustains in the lacing, and it, 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 like, fills your mouth, and it just hangs. It, pillowy. It, pillowy. Actually, I couldn't put a word to it, but it's like always being a lick a pillow. Like a, lick a pillow that's made of, like, lick mosaic. Lick a pillow, dude. Just like, uh, no, it, like, that would be a way to describe the malt character that, like, just hangs out. I would have said soft, but pillowy. Is, a, is an interesting word. I never put it into, like, I never licked a pillow. Just so pretending I, real quick you know, to be a level two Cicerone. No big know, deal. 
everything was very balanced in here. I don't want to say any, any one overwhelmed itself. The bitterness was, it was approachable. It was soft. Let's go into our second beer here. So let's pound these bad boys and go into the next one. Cheers. Oh, just getting hammered off these oh, dippers, God. man. That's how it goes, man. You, Dude. You, that's that's the bane of the existence of the NEPA. All right. It's for science. Yes. So beer number two, we have Congress Street by Trillium Brewing, 7.2%. They don't really have much of a descriptor on their um, label here, but uh, they're in Boston, Massachusetts. Do you know much about this? Like, uh, So I see like the number four on here. Does it have any relevance to how many hops are using this, or is that just their logo? Number is that four? their logo? Four Trillium. Oh. Maybe um, I'm just overlooking this, this la label. They do have some sweet symbology in their uh, label packaging. Uh, I, to be honest, I don't know exactly what goes into that beer or if they've like disclosed what hops are used. Um, some brewers are funny about that. Oh wow! Oh wow! I got like the like, the skin of a fruit and like, but it also has like this resinous, like danky aroma, pungent. It has a little bit of acidity on the nose too. It definitely does seem a little bit more um, acidic than the tree apple. So. Oh, wow. The flavor of this beer is much different. Malt isn't really the focus. Mm -hmm. It's definitely the hop flavor. I do like it that the fact that it has more bitterness than the previous beer we had, the Treehouse. Right. So, and I think that that sort of runs across both breweries' beers. The things that I've noticed drinking beers from each of them is that Treehouse is more of that like juice and they play off a little bit of that sweetness a little bit maltier on the backbone beer um whereas Trillium to me it's a little bit leaner and meaner it's a little bit got more of that bite like that classic bitterness uh that persists throughout there are uh, many different approaches to kind of brewing this little sub style I do get yeast I get like a a lot more yeast I want to say this correctly I get more <laughs> yeast flavor in the beer and i don't mean like in terms of like fruity flavor but i actually can taste like, like that there's yeast in suspension in, and there was like yeast still in the beer and it's not like it's a bad thing actually this beer oh, is, it, is, is a great beer it stands out a little bit more to me in comparison to the previous beer their hop aroma is, is much more dank yep it's more acidic but it's like you're almost like popping open a fresh grapefruit and it's beautiful um, nice. I like the acidity of this beer, and I like the fact that it's more bitter than the previous batch. Or not previous, previous batch. Beer, yeah. Previous beer Alter was um, a little bit more sweet for me. Want to pop it out for comparison? Yeah. To so this was, this was the first beer, Alter Ego, um, and this is Congress Street from Trillium. Both phenomenal beers, by the way. So these breweries like Trillium and Treehouse, they get these like big lines uh, that wait for their beer. Treehouse um, more so, but yeah. Treehouse more so. So are they running out of beer? Like are these breweries yeah. not yep. able to produce enough to supply the demand? With Treehouse in particular, yeah, they have huge lines almost every day. Part of that, I think, is their relative accessibility to people like, for example, in Connecticut, as well as people in Mass and other, you know, New England states. Because, you know, it's not from my house. It's only like an hour and a half. I live in Milford. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's not too far to go to get beer. I haven't been in a while. Just my job doesn't really permit me to like skip up there and like hang out and get beer. Uh, yeah. Anyone watching that, I, if you if you happen to have extras, I'm always looking. So <laughs> If I was to choose one of them, I'm going to choose the Trillium. I like the bitterness that like really stood out to it. It reminded me of something uh, Midwest, West Coast. It actually has a lot more hop flavor to them than anything I've ever had. But um, I would go with the Trillium because it had that bitterness that I was looking for in a beer. Sure. What would you have chosen? Uh, you know, it depends on what I'd, I, I'd want to be sitting down and drinking. I've had both of these beers before and experienced them on their own. <laughs> and yeah. It's it, it really it's it's almost insane to to say one's better than the other or to try to choose. I think they're both. Very well brewed. You know, personally, uh, I would have liked to see a little bit more care and attention paid to however they um, chose to, you know, crash, find, package mm -hmm. the Trillium mm -hmm. to keep that sediment out. Um, you know, and that's that's a point of debate. I mean, like I said, both of them were great beers. Well, let's also consider, are the dates printed on here? Some of they are. Um, <laughs> uh, September 6th. 9-21. Oh. 
That's interesting. So you actually, you know, based on the argument that... So we are settles, drinking these fresh. This is right. today is October 1st. Right. Uh, fresh yeah. Nazis. Come on out and hate on us. Yes. So the trillium is 921. This is 96. So if you go by that whole, like, theory that some people are espousing that stuff drops out over time, um, in this case... I wouldn't um, say so. No. Because this was in no. the fridge just as long as this yeah. beer was. Yeah. And nothing dropped out. This one, like you said, that is more to my taste as well. Just in the term, in terms of like what I like to brew, I do like that 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 punching and persistent bitterness. But I can also appreciate Treehouse as well. Uh, and there is something about Treehouse beers like that from the first time I crack open a beer. I think the first one I ever had was Lights On, a pale ale, and just getting that ridiculously saturated fruitiness. They have something unique. Trillium has something unique. Uh, Alchemist has something unique. You know, Hill Farmstead. And, and you know, tons of other breweries. Because those breweries are by no means the be-all, end-all of the New England style. They're just perhaps the most recognizable yeah. um, ones. Beers are kicking in. They've kicked in. <laughs> beers are in effect. We also have other beers to drink right now. Trillium Trias. And we're going to blend these fuckers. I just did the triple, the trifecta uh, of, of it. So now that we've drank in some beautiful New England IPAs, um, we definitely recommend checking out Treehouse, Trillium, Nebco, Two Roads. Any other recommendations? Night Shift. I think you said Kent Falls. Outer Light. How does someone know where you're going to be next? Okay. Uh, yeah, really anything um, that I'm teaching or talking about or pouring at, whatever those things um, may be, uh, you can find me at Stephen Bach Homebrews on Facebook. I think the URL is facebook.com uh, slash SB Homebrews. Uh, and then I'm also on Instagram as Stephen Bach Homebrews on Untapped as well. We're a verified homebrewery. Make sure to check out Stephen Bach Homebrews, Stephen Bach on Facebook and Instagram as well as Untapped. Oh my God, I got to fuck that up. I got to redo it. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Thanks for tuning in for this episode of School of Hops. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like this video, click subscribe. Also follow us at Armada Brewing on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you haven't done so already, check out our homeboy, Stephen Bach, here on Facebook, Instagram, and Untapped so you can follow his beers that he's brewing. Thank you, Stephen, for joining us today and sharing some of your awesome brew. Thanks, man. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> oh, I mean, I bet. You just gonna, you just gonna twi twiddle, or are you gonna play something fun? You can play something fun. I should probably put it in actual tune. I'm like too drunk to do it by ear. I have found in this place that is circling all around the sun. What a beautiful dream that could flash on the screen in a blink of an eye and be gone from me. Soft and sweet, I have no top and in reach above the tree. And our ashes will fly from the aeroplane over the sea But for now we are young, let us lay in the sun And count every beautiful thing we can see Love to be in the arms of all that I'm keeping here with me
this life we have found here tonight There is music that sounds from the streets There are lights in the clouds and there's ghosts all around Hear a voice as it's rolling and ringing through me Soft and sweet, how the notes all bend and reach above the tree Sleeping winter clothes with love in your arms so long ago. Now you don't even know his name. What a beautiful face I have found in this place That is circling all around the sun When we meet on a cloud I'll be laughing out loud I'll be laughing at everyone that I see Can't believe how strange it is to be anything <laughs> Dog's passed out. Dog is like, hey dude, what's up? Alright, I'm done. <laughs>